Welcome back. This is Emily Seal here with Motlow College to discuss research methods. So I will start this lecture kind of presuming that you've been keeping up with the reading. Uh, today we'll touch on chapter 6, 7, and 9. Um, a lot of these are things that you learned in English class. Uh, hopefully you've written a research paper before, so we're building off of some prior knowledge. Another thing I'd like you to read before we really get into this lecture is the example of an informative speech on steg steg <laughs> steganography. There we go. Steganography. Uh, hidden messages. I think that's a really great example of how to orally cite your sources. We'll talk about that a little bit today. It's a great example of a narrow college level informative topic right? We're not going to talk about um, celebrities. We're not going to talk about necessarily um, hobbies, right? Those were our earlier speeches. They were a little less academic. Now we're getting into the informative um, academic types of speeches, right? The informative speech and then the persuasive speech also is a more academic assignment. So would ask you to apply yourself some great informative speeches that I hear over the history of things, history of, uh, you know, whatever you're into, um, the pros and cons on any given current issue or major policy decision we're making here in America. So these are what the types of um, topics that I appreciate and that I feel are not um, a waste of my time. So I'll uh, I also encourage cross-curricular integration. If you're studying something in your sociology class, and your psychology class, there's a good chance that um, it interests us as well. So if you want to pull something in from another class and share it with us, uh, just remember that we don't have the jargon or the prior knowledge. So if you're going to teach us how to do something or um, you're building on a certain amount of knowledge that we have. Remember, you're not talking to your psychology or your class. You're talking to a class of people who maybe haven't ever taken a psychology class before. So you might have a little more explaining of the back uh, fundamentals before you can get into your specific speech. So you can use a Kanye quote. I always appreciate a little personality, but remember you have to have at least four academic sources. So if I see a quotation from a blog post on your work cited, I'll say, oh, okay, that was just to tell me where you got this Kanye quote or the lyric to the Kanye song, Kanye West. But that is only that is only informational. That, that would mean that you would then have five sources because four sources need to make up the bulk of your research. Uh, you know, four different books. Uh, one of them is maybe a uh, encyclopedia. We're, we're going to do some heavy duty research. And as always, I still don't require you to cite your photos. I just don't see that modeled in the professional setting yet. Um, when I do see it modeled on you know, speeches like in TED or in conferences that I go to, if I see people really citing their photos, then I'll start making my students do that. But the only time you need to cite a photo is if it is a graph that has information in it or if it's a famous piece of art, okay? Those I really do need citations for. <laughs> uh, story of my life. Um, so some of you have the charm and the charisma and you're quick-witted and you can give a speech on the fly. I would like to challenge you for the informative speech that you really know what you're talking about and that you don't try to wing it. Uh, you know, if you've already written a research paper and you're, and you're getting up to speech, it, give a speech about the research that you've already done, that's one thing. Um, but if you're telling us, um, let me give you an example. Please do not fabricate evidence. Don't tell me according to the economy, 
the economist uh, of this current issue if you haven't actually read the economist uh, don't in in, in extemp or speaking uh, extemp which is a debate event uh, they did a study of how many people were actually just fabricating evidence and it was so disheartening please don't lie uh, don't say you read a book if you didn't read a book don't put a source on your citation of an entire article if you only read one sentence um, you know if I find your speech interesting I might want to go back and look at your source or I might just want to double check that your source is actually supporting what you're saying because if it's time to hand that back to you and I've looked at your source and I see that it doesn't really support your speech that's gonna affect your grade okay Whew, sorry I don't like being the bad guy but sometimes I have to brainstorming brainstorming is free association to generate ideas most of you have probably done graphic organizers around brainstorming in elementary or or high school where you uh, wrote down as many things as you could or you put um, lots of different images on a paper uh, some of you are visual brainstormers some of you are uh, oral you want to just kind of talk about it and that means you can come to my office and we can shoot ideas back and forth uh, brainstorming is different for everybody and it's a highly individualistic process this is part of the reason that I require you to turn in your topic to me well in advance so that we can look and see okay is this topic something that um, that you are committed to talking about because when you turn it in and you committed to talking about it then that's when um, you have that week of research and you're ready to present by the time that you give your speech that's kind of my idea behind asking you to turn in your topics in advance is, is to make sure that you know what you're talking about you've had time to sort of move on from moving from choosing your topic into the deeper levels um, because I know some of you would research two speeches and then flip a coin before you got up to give your speech and decide which speech to give and and what ends up happening in that situation is you have two mediocre speeches at best it's better to focus our efforts onto one speech and be ready to give that speech. My biggest question when people ask me about their topic is, do you like it? Is it one that you can get behind, one that you like? I'm not asking what your mom would give a speech on. I'm not asking what your um, mentor would give a speech on. What do you like? What do you, what, um, for lack of a better word turns you on right that's in the inside the actor studio questionnaire it's what turns you on and what turns you off and people will say um, laughter skateboarding whatever you really like uh, you know turn that into an intellectual pursuit and I I think that's a good way to start your careers is to, is to um, follow your interest but that always has the counterbalance of your hearer. Yes, we do care what interests you, but we also want to know what is that audience like. So I might want us to talk about, um, you know, mortgages and loans, right? Because I'm a homeowner and that's what interests me. But I know that the people in the room, most of them have not bought a home yet. That's a good five years down the road, maybe. So it's not something that they're really interested in yet. Um, so I might instead talk about how to decorate my home <laughs> because most of them have apartments that they could decorate or a bedroom at home that they could decorate so what is your interest versus your listeners interests um, sometimes the appropriateness of a topic will come from the occasion at which the speech is given so maybe you know right now as I record this it's Halloween time and um, maybe you want to talk about the history of Halloween maybe that's maybe a topic that is apt for the time and the location with which you're giving the speech right um, if you're asked to speak at the Rotaract Club 
right? Well, what are those people interested in? Where is it, right? Where are you meeting? Uh, what's going on? Got to do some digging if you're asked to speak at a special, for a special occasion. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, databases, databases later on today, but often what I will do when I'm researching a paper, when I was asked to give a speech, is I would just go walk around the library and say, okay, I'm in the self-help section, which I think is interesting, self-help uh, materials. Uh, so let me just look around in the self-help section where uh, this one is about um, dressing for success and this one is about um, you know promises and how to keep your promises and so I'd kind of just look around and thumb through and then I'd check the book out of the library and maybe that's what grabs my attention I follow my instinct right follow your instinct um, I've bought many a book in a used bookstore just because I thought hey this might make a good topic for a class discussion right so uh, if you are a kinesthetic learner like me right that means that you need real world examples you need to move around sometimes physically going out into your environment whether it be a library or the woods and get yourself moving that will sometimes free your mind and open your mind and help you um, to focus in a strange way. That's my two cents. Specific purpose, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about how to create an outline because remember the outline ought to have a specific purpose on it, right? Such as to persuade, to entertain, to inform. So we want to make sure that that specific purpose is your topic and we want to make it narrow enough, specific enough to warrant an academic level speech. So let me give you an example of a good one to inform my audience on stenography because that is nice and specific and it begins with, all of the purposes begin with to inform the audience, right? We're audience focused and then I've got my topic at the end of that sentence, stenography. Good. So when I ask you for your specific purpose, I'm asking for your topic sentence within the context of understanding the purpose of the speech, right? Just another reminder on your outline, you ought to have a thesis statement, right? You ought to have a thesis statement or a central idea, but your thesis statement is a summative one sentence synopsis of what you're saying. I get so many office appointments about thesis statements. Oh, but Miss Seal, I can't just, I can't say it in one sentence. I, it's bigger than that. Well, if it's bigger than that, that honestly probably means you need to spend a little bit of time with your editor hat on. You need to go through and cut, cut, cut. You know, if you can't necessarily pay tribute to three people in three minutes. You need to just pick one person, right? Uh, unless maybe they're in a band together. <laughs> that would be an exception. Uh, if you're going to inform us about um, the history of something so huge that you can't fit it into a six to eight minute speech, um, then you can't Th that will be reflected in your thesis statement. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, something from 1886 to the to the present. Uh, that's a nice simplistic way of saying it, but if you can't simplify it then you're probably um, not ready to give me your thesis statement yet, right? Which means you need to spend more time alone with your uh, speech. All right, now we get into the sticky world of research. So, obviously, there are untrustworthy sources in the world. I seriously doubt that Malia and Sasha were dr busted for cocaine. <laughs> I think that if that were actually a news story, we would probably have a larger media presence around that. 
right? Um, there are irresponsible journalists in the world. Now that is a shame, and it's a shame that I have to open my research speech by talking about the irresponsible journalists, because there are many, many journalists who have died in order to give us the truth and to seek the truth and to bring back the truth to us. And so um, it's a shame that I have to start this by warning you about gathering information because you need to be able to evaluate your sources and look and see, is this a source that I can trust? Because you can't trust every source. And a big part of what your job in college is, is to discern and to start to look at sources and say, is this a source I can trust or is this a source I can't trust? Be careful, even the best newspaper is going to have what's called editorials. And editorials are largely opinion-based. Opinion-based. And especially for your informative speech, that's not the goal. The goal is not to express opinions, it's to report on the facts. So if you start editorializing in your informative speech, that's going to, I'm going to take points off of your grade because the goal is to be unbiased, is to see things from both perspective, the pro and the con on a given issue. And so if it is a letter to the edi editor or an editorial piece, it really doesn't have a place in the informative speech. That doesn't mean you can't use it at all in the persuasive speech, but particularly in the informative speech. Um, now, blogs are okay, but auto blogs are pirated websites where if you open it up and there's like a hundred videos and pop-ups and there's a good chance you need to run away, run away. Broken record, don't use anything 2.0, anything wiki, anything that I can go in and edit, please don't use it. Um, <laughs> beware <laughs> of using fiction as a source. And I do love documentaries. If you spent more than an hour with me, I've probably said to you, did you see that documentary about? Uh, it's right there along with, did you see the Ted, uh, Ted video about? Because I just... I, I really, I'm a auditory and a visual person. You're much more likely to find me in front of um, a computer screen or listening to a podcast about rather than sitting down and opening an, a real book <laughs> uh, because I do enjoy, those are kind of my learning styles. So um, I enjoy documentaries. I think that they are often there to uncover a truth that a lot of people overlook. The reason I say beware is because a lot of documentarians, people who film documentaries, they're very, the tone of a documentary is usually inflammatory and, and there to get you fired up about whatever topic they're giving you. And so I just say beware um, because you're going to have a lot of bias in documentary and that doesn't mean that they're not telling you the truth but the sources that they're pulling in they're only going to pull in the things that already support their point of view so databases these are your best friend if you have not already been on the library's website to click into the databases I highly encourage you to do that if you um, no matter what campus you're at, go ask your friendly librarian where are the da databases located on the website and they can show you. Um, it's only a couple clicks away. If you're on the Motlow main page and then you go to library and then you can go to databases from there. My favorite is Opposing Viewpoints and Context. I think that is an excellent um, source for the kinds of speeches that you're going to give in my class. The other reason why I like it is if you're going to give a pros con speech, you have your sources right there, right? What is the pros or the cons of any given issue? You know, it's it's right there. So take for example GMOs. Um, you know, there are some pros to any sort of modification. I mean. Obviously, it's gonna we're gonna have more food around. <laughs> That's good, right? But there are also some very serious cons, uh, including perhaps cancer. So we really need to be looking at GMOs. We can see the positive positive sides of that, and we can see the negative sides. Um, and 
opposing viewpoints and contexts is going to give you credible sources already vetted and put on that database and they're going to be the best sources on that topic because a research librarian, somebody with a doctorate in research has been the one to pull that article and say this is the important article. The other thing that I like about Opposing Viewpoints and Context is it has an encyclopedia entry there for the topic. So what happens sometimes in a research process is we we jump in without truly knowing the encyclopedia definition of what's going on. We kind of walk into the conversation halfway through and then we kind of got to get caught up on it. And and that's fair, right? There's always going to be sides of an issue that we're blind to for one reason or another. So going in back and looking at that sort of base definition of what you're talking about is really helpful, I think, in the with the nature of the informative speech. The reason I have a file cabinet here is because a database, you can think of it as a filing cabinet. So while there's a citation there that they give you already ready to go, um, and it actually says opposing viewpoints in context there on the MLA citation, um, you can notice it's always quoting the Atlantic, New York Times, uh, The Guardian. It's already, it's just a filing cabinet. You wouldn't say in your speech according to opposing viewpoints in context because that would be like citing the filing cabinet. That's the same thing as me saying to somebody, I saw this on Facebook or I saw this on Pinterest, right? Facebook is just the filing cabinet. It doesn't say anything about the credibility of what you saw. It just tells you where you found it. So please be careful about making sure you're you're giving credit to the original producing organization, whether that be a magazine, a newspaper, a book. Um, it You need to give credit to the author person who said it first, which can sometimes take a little bit of digging, like going through files in a filing cabinet. All right, stop preaching and start meddling here when we talk about journalists. Now, we're skipping over chapter eight. We've already kind of talked about chapter eight, so scooch on over with me to page 113. All right, so journalists are human beings. Right? If you were to go shake a journalist's hand, they would tell you who they voted for. They might tell you what church they attend. They could tell you where they like to hang out on a Friday night. Do they have children? Do they not have children? Did they have parents? They're humans, just like anyone else is a human being. Now, journalists have editors, and journalists have a certain level of buffering, right? Just like I can sit down at a blog and say anything, but a journalist usually has a few people who are also sort of helping them with their work and critiquing it for them. But they're still creatures of opinion. So even though it's looked down on to editorialize or to state your opinions outright, they're still creatures of opinion. So we have to look at the believability or dependability of any given journalist and the writing that they're doing. Any given author, I'm saying journalist, but any author, um, even your history book, what the, the information that's in your history book goes through the lens of someone, right? History is written by the history makers. Uh, what's the other opinions there is <laughs> a whole different story sometimes. So when you're looking at any story, ask yourself, what's, who's, what's their deal? Why are they reporting on this? Why do they care? We as rhetoricians particularly look at word choice. What are the words that they're choosing? And we can often tell someone's political quotient, uh, by political quotient I mean their, where they lie on liberal versus conservative. Uh, we can tell that just by the, the words that they choose. So this is pulled from an NPR article, which I think it's interesting that they included NPR in the study, even though it's an NPR um, 
it's under the umbrella of NPR, uh, called Freakonomics. Freakonomics is a book, a couple books actually now, a podcast that I listen to, and um, a radio show, obviously, because it's NPR, National Public Radio. And uh, what the Freakonomic authors did is they they went to this uh, gross close and Melio's way of looking at words and quantifying that and saying, okay, well, based on these words that they're choosing, that kind of makes them more conservative or more liberal. Now, 50-50 being like the baseline, we can see that Fox News, not surprisingly, is a little more conservative and the Wall Street Journal is a little more liberal, right? NPR is a little more liberal, but we, if you do a Google search of um, political quotient, you can find any given news sources sort of um, political leanings. The reason that I bring this up is if you were to give me an informative speech but only use Fox News Network um, information, well maybe that's not, maybe that's only showing things from a more conservative perspective. Could we go over and look in the Wall Street Journal and say how how did they report on the very exact same article, the very exact same news story? What are they saying? What is CBS saying about this Fox News story? Because sometimes, honestly, we have to look at both Fox News and CBS to see the full story. Hey, and then maybe we even look at BBC. Because what is, what is the British perspective on what's going on in America? So looking at things from more than one perspective is a very important skill for any um, discerning person, right? Don't just look at it the way that you see it. Try seeing it through somebody else's eyes and then you'll have a more empathetic research understanding. <laughs> All right. Oh, this is a hard-hitting lecture today. So, statistics. I encourage you to use statistics. Any number that supports your point of view is good, right? You can see here that I have a picture of a group of people trying to split the bill because anytime I feel confident about math skills in America, then I try to split the bill with someone, <laughs> right? We've all decided to go Dutch and we all sat at the table together and, okay, are we going to all split the bill equally or, okay, well, maybe everybody just pitches $10 in and then there's $30 left over and we have a really happy waiter. Um, <laughs> we as a nation are math challenged. Can we agree? To some extent we are math challenged and I don't say that to celebrate the fact that we're math challenged. I say that just to be honest. If you take a marketing class they're going to they're going to dedicate a large portion of the class to explaining how do we break down numbers and scientific information and statistical data in a way that our audience understands it. Well, how do we break that down in a way that our audience can understand it? And often it looks like making a graph, which we talked about last class. Often it looks like dumbing down the statistic and saying only one in four people rather than throwing a lot of zeros out behind it. As I record this, uh, the presidential democratic uh, debate happened a couple days ago and Bernie Sanders got a lot of slack because he, he kept saying the 1%, the 1%, the 1%, which we all understand is the super, super wealthy and the 1%, but then he kept throwing out other numbers and percentages. Uh, you know, this many people are unemployed and this many people are living on the streets and this many people and it can be exhausting, right, to get all that math thrown at you. And then, of course, you know, according to who is that many people living on the street? According to who is, you know, they're that percentage of unemployment. So I think it is good and right that Bernie Sanders is supporting his perspective with statistical evidence. But he is being misunderstood in the process because he is throwing out the statistic without completely unpacking the uh, research procedures, who conducted that research, according to what, um, you know, who says there's that many homeless people, right? So anytime you have a statistic, 
uh, we're going to round it off. We're going to try to make that a unit of measurement that's familiar to my audience. We're not going to talk in meters. We're not going to talk in um, any, you know, we're going to talk in American, <laughs> not necessarily uh, a foreign system of understanding, because, right, that's how uh, NASA got in trouble. We're going to clarify the relationships between our statistics um, and, and saying that this is what's going on. Uh, like this is what like I said just a moment ago this is what Fox News said and this is what the Washington Post said so looking at several different statistics maybe from different areas if it's something that's truly truly contentious, contentious such as the unemployment rate um, and then the best piece of evidence about it uh, is on page 120 and that is the impact you know you can tell us how many water bottles are wasted every year but if you say those water bottles will span the circumference of the entire globe right that's an overwhelming statistic that really the impact of that the enormity of it is helpful for us so try to make it in concrete try if it's a large number try to quant try to make it in some way um, visual for us if you can uh, make it into a graph or find a graph online and cite that for us so statistical data is tricky but please use it please use statistics now I really like the advice of not relying exclusively on statistics we can really only take about a statistic per sub point please don't rattle off a whole bunch of statistics and not tell us what they mean I'm really going to only allow about one statistic per subpoint because if your entire speech is just statistic, 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 it's not going to be absorbed by your audience. They, they will, I can guarantee you, they will go into overload math brain, splitting the bill brain, and it's going to overwhelm them. So we need to spoon feed our audience, especially when it comes to math. All right, so let's just look at some general rules of thumb when it comes to evaluating and testing your evidence and being a discerning person. The first thing you want to ask yourself is um, timeliness. This is at the bottom of page 123. The bottom of page 123. Is this still the truth, right? Is this at this moment the truth? So I love the example in your book about a woman who was talking about breast cancer and she said, you know, the way that we treat breast cancer is we remove the breast. Well, perhaps when her mother had a mastectomy, that was the way that we did it. But if we look at what is currently being done, we're having a lot more lumpectomies, right? Because they've found out that they can remove just part of the breast and they don't need something as drastic as a mastectomy. So that is the most current information. And if you're talking about something that's relating to medicine or politics or current issues, you need to make sure, I mean, a debate person will love to say, according to this morning's new newspaper, right? According to the Tennessean uh, this morning, because it shows a sense of currency and timeliness. Um, our current president as I record this speech Dr. Kinkle you know he had to give an opening assembly speech that was how he met all of his employees is at this opening assembly speech and I noticed that he quoted two different sources he said the front page of and he said as I opened my Google today what the Gmail um, news story was so he was giving us um, he was proving to us and sharing with us that he reads the newspaper every day and he knew that that was something that a room full of academics would love to hear is that he's in some way building um, information gathering into his daily life because if you are supposed to be current on you know if you're a heart surgeon I want to know that you've read the most current journals about how the best way to perform uh, a certain surgery is if you're going to 
if you're going to operate on my father because that's something that changes every year hopefully science is getting better and better I don't want to hear you say oh I'm still performing it the same way I performed it 20 years ago because right heart surgery has evolved so is it timely relevance and that doesn't always necessarily mean that the article there's anything wrong with the article itself but some of you will spend a considerable amount of your time reading things that have nothing to do with the speech you're going to give right you'll get lost in Google land reading about um, puppies <laughs> instead of focusing on uh, perhaps uh, you know you're gonna talk about the pit bull as a breed the history of the pit bull well that is a good informative speech but you may get on this sidetrack of how to potty train a you know puppy and, and that's not relevant to the speech that you're giving I don't want to hear information in any given speech that's not supporting the logic should always flow up you should always use anecdotal evidence or um, research source sources to support one common topic or theme authority right and I ask you for this what is your authority to give on an uh, what is the authority you have to give a speech on any given topic so you also want to ask your authors that right if I'm gonna walk into a room and say hey I think I'd like to perform that heart surgery today there's a good chance that you would be like uh no <laughs> right go to the journalists go to the people who are experts in their field if it's something having to do with heart surgery is the word doctor in front of their name right is the letters MD at the end of the article and that's gonna be important to me accuracy right are we getting the most accurate information and for some of you who are not detail people one zero at the end of a statistic is a huge difference make sure you pay attention to how many zeros are on that statistic we need to know accurately and then what was the purpose of the original article some of you will want to give an informative speech about the history of essential oils because you sell essential oils well my problem with your research base is its bias those all of those sources about essential oils are all from advertisers right and advertisers are trying to sell you something so the purpose of their articles is sell 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 so I would challenge you to go to the library and say historically what have people said about essential oils I'm not anti essential oils I don't have anything I love lavender oil it's my favorite uh, but I would ask you what was the purpose of the article that was originally intent if it was to sell me something it's a bias source and it's not one of your four credible sources okay so you've done all this research don't forget to say your sources as you speak and you see that modeled wonderfully in that example speech in the back of your book say according to say the source and then also say the date um, especially if that date is relevant now you won't always have relevant dates so if I'm gonna talk about the history of the Civil War for example I might have a Civil War speech and I'm gonna talk about the Battle of Gettysburg now a date isn't really that important about when that book was published so saying okay this book was written last year that might be interesting to know because it's a current source but it's not vital given that topic if I'm gonna give a speech about heart surgery I definitely want to hear those dates right <laughs> speaking of Gettysburg hmm okay please do not ever put on an outline to me good quotes or book rags right because book rags is a 2.0 source I can just go in there and say I hate men according to Miss Seal which is not true at all I love men I have a son I have a husband <laughs> it's an outlier is and doesn't work so I prefer you um, to make sure that you're quoting the entire work right if you're gonna quote a book make sure you've read the book or at least the chapter I want you to be familiar with the person who said the quote 
And then, of course, my favorite is Bartleby.com. That's Bartlett's familiar quotations. If you don't already have one in your home, uh, I would go over to Barnes & Noble or a used bookstore now and grab one. Uh, I just love to flip through a quote book. I think it's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon standing on the shoulders of giants. Um... <laughs> there's this horrible thing that happened where a <laughs> a someone she has a pseudonym online but she took Taylor Swift pictures and put Hitler quotes on them <laughs> and she put them on Pinterest they had like 500 repins before people started to notice that Taylor Swift didn't actually say that and that that was a famous Hitler quote. And the reason that this anonymous style blogger did that is to remind us that we don't need to just blindly follow anybody, even if it's Taylor Swift, who I deeply adore. I think she's absolutely a wonderful songwriter and a bossy lady, which I always like to see, um, but we don't need to blindly follow and believe everything we read on the internet, right? Um, the most compelling speakers, the most engaging people, uh, like Hitler, had a way of saying things that's, that would draw people in, but just reading one pull quote is what makes this lemmings, right? We need to be discerning. We need to be looking at things on a deeper level, so... <laughs> uh, if you want to Google what I'm just talking about, um, oh, it's some combination of Adolf Hitler and Taylor Swift. What was it? I think it was maybe Hift. I think that's what they were called, Hifts. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, oh, goodness, this has been a heavy class today. I care so much about research methods, which is why I get so impassioned when I talk about it. I think that your English teacher has probably said things that are very similar to you. Probably your science teacher has talked about the importance of having a solid and sound research method. Uh, any vocation that you go into, you're going to need to be the discerning person who looks at any given situation and can tell us us uh, who's telling the truth and who isn't and uh, why so uh, as being an informed electorate right we need to look at who's telling the truth and who isn't and uh, what is the truth is something that is a lifelong pursuit one that I think is a worthy goal thank you so much for listening today uh, break a leg on your informative and persuasive speeches if you need help about any given um, source you're not sure if it's credible email me you know a week in advance and I can definitely help you discern whether or not it's credible as always thank you for listening